I figured I'd give you all a talk on uh, allergies beyond just sneezing. So just because you have or your loved one has a primary immune deficiency, technically that also could predispose someone to an allergic disorder, right? Because your immune system, there's three ways it can act. And actually it can act in all three ways defectively. One is immune deficiency. You just don't have enough ammunition to beat down your bacteria, virus, or fungus. One is overactive immune deficiency, so it starts picking away at home base. It's bored of stuff outside. It's autoimmunity, right? Which you're at an increased risk if you have an immune deficiency. And the third one is, is going, yeah, yeah, I got this one, is misfiring into the trees, pollen, into the plate, food, to the street, cat, dog, right? So it's allergy. So it's gonna be a focused talk, more so on all kind of the types of allergic disorders. I'm sure there are gonna be a couple or three that you may think of or have that are not gonna be addressed. I figured I'd hit on some of the, uh, the big ones. So what is allergic rhinitis, right? That, you could see this gentleman here doing the allergic salute. We call it the allergic, <laughs> yes, how are you, you know? And usually with this, you will see a crease in the nose, a nasal crease. And you'll see that a lot in kids. Um, and it's, pro it's prominent during sunny weather, so summers. Why? Because if you have a fold or a cut or whatever, you know this. The first thing a dermatologist will tell you and a pediatrician should tell you too, if you have a cut, don't go out in the sun for the next six months so that your skin completely heals. And that edge that's open is now covered so you don't look like you you know, you cooked chicken basically and turned it white from flesh. So same thing here, you'll see a crease in, in kids or adults' noses and you can tell they're doing this a lot because they got that semi-permanent wrinkle at this point, which will go away with correcting the allergen. So this is, now, you guys are all experts in IgG, right? Immunoglobulin G. Wow, that's, I call that the, uh, the uh, secret service. Now they're, we're in DC. I'm gonna have helicopters flying with this kind of face profile. <laughs> so IgGs are kind of like your secret service. They're inside the house, they're protecting you, all right? Outside of that, and I'm belittling the immune system, you got your IgAs. Those are your gardeners. Gardeners are still gonna be a bit of a deterrent for kids who are gonna throw eggs or you know graffiti your house or whatever, but they're not the greatest fighters. They're kind of out in the mucous membrane. IgE is a nuisance because it's, it's the guns you did not hire. It's going after silly stuff that it's misrecognizing as bacteria, virus, fungus, okay? So it's an IgE triggered re reaction, usually after exposure to an allergen, and the constellation of symptoms, at least for uh, allergic rhinitis, mainly include itching, sneezing. Sneezing is actually a neural reflex, rhinorrhea, or runny of the, runniness of the nose, usually posterior and or anterior. If you hear someone say, especially as they get a little older, I'm just getting a drippy nose, that could be a non-allergic rhinitis, vasomotor rhinitis, especially if it's triggered by newspaper print, uh, being next to a printer, cleaning agents, all right, or cold and hot coming out of the shower. That's kind of a, oh man, I just cannot control the drip. And usually there's no, um, I'm seeing the 30 and over people going, I think you have it. No, I think you have it. <laughs> you annoy me with it. No, you annoy me with it. Um, so that's an, usually a non-itching because it's got no histamine release, drip. So here you got to think it could be itching, your palate can itch, your nose could be congested, and a lot of times you're going to have eye involvement. Why? It's probably hitting you in the eye, the, the allergen, but you also have a nasolacrimal duct, which if some of you have done the opposite, put a funky eye drop, you taste it. Why? Because the nose and the eustachian tube empty out into the mouth. All right, so if you've got that inflammation, if you're sick or with allergic rhinitis, and you're like, ah, it's getting in my ears. Oh, when I do that uh, saline rinse, it gets into my ears. It's not gonna get in your ears, it's the sensation. That's why you have a specialty called ENT, ear, nose, throat. Because all those nerves end up running together like a big coiled cable up to the brain to send a sensation of, this is coming from ear, nose, throat. 
but it's not telling you which one. You usually translate it to, I got a sore throat. Oh, it's, it's in my ears. And then if you correctly say it, it's, it's my nose. All right? Now, statistically, it's the second leading cause of chronic disease in the U.S. I mean, in medical school, when I thought about doing allergy, my surgery classmates, ones who were like, you want me to spot you in the gym? I'm like, no, I haven't put the weights on yet, but it's okay. Uh, those would be like, you know, this is a wimpy specialty, allergic or allergies. Yeah, but when it's impeding on your performance, say you're a speaker, you got business meetings, right? And beyond that, where you got so much pooling of allergic uh, fluid that it translates into sinus infection, sinus infection, sinus infection, then you have an issue with morbidity, right? And it's taken away from your productivity. So the prevalence is definitely increasing. Why? I'll show you reasons in a second. And in some surveys, you will see that almost two-thirds of patients consider the symptoms to be moderate or severe. So it's serious enough that the patients are coming to the doctor and saying, please take, get rid of this thing or I'm going to you know, throw my nose out. <laughs> and then, you know, I, I said funnier stuff than that. I can't believe you guys laughed at that one. <laughs> 20% of patients believe that their health care provider is not taking them seriously, and I, I agree in, with that uh, consensus as well. So in allergies in America, which is a huge uh, survey, when they looked at what are your most bothersome symptoms, and number one actually was my eyes. My eyes are watery. But again, it's this bad song and dance that the nose and the eyes are doing, and that's followed by facial pain, which I take that one seriously because guess what? For those of, of us who are not in the immune deficiency diagnosis, those patients will say, I got an infection in my nose, I got an infection in my sinuses. And they keep going to the ENT and coming back being told that, listen, I scoped them, I scraped the mucosa, biopsy, all this stuff, CT scan, everything's clear. But yet they've got this sensation of facial fullness and pain that's driving them nuts. So that's pretty much number two. Repeated sneezing with that young man, I, forget, I don't know what his name is. He's like, hey Thomas. He's like, yep, that's me. And I stopped sneezing. <laughs> uh, the runny nose, the red itchy eyes, the post nasal drip, right? That posterior uh, nasal drip, headache, and stuffed up uh, nasal sensation. So what are the allergens? For those of you who are new to this, I think most of you, who here is from the Midwest? Okay, so you're familiar with ragweed. Oh yeah. That's actually the latest one to pop out during the year. In a calendar year, first you'll get usually mountain cedar popping up pretty early. And that's why the experiments are done with mountain cedar, all right, in Texas especially, because there's no other pollen in the area, usually around February, okay? But the trees come in in the spring. The grasses are in the summer. Now, where I am, anybody from the West Coast? Cool. So you know, especially in California, Arizona, that summer really is February till November. So grasses proliferate. They think, oh, it's time to reproduce. So they're pollinating everything in the air. And like I said, the, the weeds are in the fall. Now, when are they pollinating? Is any time of day the same? So one of the biggest advice pieces that I'll give is try to keep your windows and doors closed at dusk and dawn. Because these green life things out there, they're alive and they're thinking too. They are throwing up their pollen at dusk and dawn. Why? You don't see trees walking over and mating with another tree, right? Grass going, woohoo, grass party. No, they're stationary, so they got to catch wildlife throw the pollen on them so that they'll go cross-breed, right? The squirrel, the bird, they're not hanging out at high noon or midnight. They're actually going home or going to work, just like we are, but at dusk and dawn. They actually have a little longer hours than we do. All right, another prognostic cause here, which I call the amplifier. It's the instigator and the amplifier. It's not an allergen per se, is the lovely fumes that were increasing in the air with human uh, advancement. So smog and part particles in the air. How do those work? They act as adjuvants. 
Much like a vaccine, if I gave you pertussis vaccine, a pertussis bug, it's not a great immunogen. But I throw in an adjuvant in that, much like if you guys know the difference between pneumococcal vaccine and Prevnar. So Prevnar has a, an adjuvant component to it that says, all right, let's, let's do this song and dance in a heavier way. Recognize me, right? That's what this one does. So polluted areas you'll see a lot greater, and that's part of the reason we say the, the rate of asthma has really doubled in the last couple of decades. And so we think of allergic rhinitis as kind of, oh, just an itchy nose or whatever, and Jimmy or Joey or jo Josephine are going to be fine. But it's actually interlinked with otitis media or the middle ear infection, sinusitis, and asthma. And so let's look through some common allergic conditions. And I put this picture up there because um, I also like to differentiate between an angioedema and urticaria, or hives with swelling, versus just swelling, which might be something else. So here you could see a kid with a, a swollen uh, set of lips, redness and splotchiness, most likely probably drank or ate or got injected with something that's allergenic. Okay, so one of the earliest things you'll find right after the newborn period is milk protein allergy. It presents in the first couple of weeks of life after introduction of cow milk protein and it could act in a couple of ways. One is allergic and one is a, a toxic enterocolitis where you'll have some bleeding actually and once you stop the allergen or the toxin you'll see a reversion in, uh, to, to health. And uh, essentially to differentiate this, you can ask your pediatrician or allergist to actually do component testing. So usually we say skin tests are really good at picking up allergies, but some of the blood tests have gotten so good that we can actually tell if egg allergy for you might be just a no-no because you're reacting to both the the cookable and changeable part and the sturdy part versus for you, uh, you could probably eat cooked eggs, you know, into a cake or whatever, but just don't eat scrambled eggs and lightly, you know, runny eggs. Okay? Milk, same thing. Wait, why did you, so, why'd you say okay for him? <laughs> He's like, mm, yeah, okay, I'll do that. You're like, okay, we will. And then from there, there are, there's a huge movement right now, and I didn't want to go into it just yet because none of these are FDA approved or past the uh, uh, phase three studies yet. Desensitization and tolerance for foods. So there's a huge movement right now looking at peanut specifically and how can we tolerate this. And actually peanut has component testing too. So you should always ask about shall we do component testing. So for peanut, I can actually predict to a 99% confidence that you will only have blotching around your mouth versus you, mm, you best not eat it because you'll end up in the ER or worse. Based on what components of peanut you're recognizing. So if it's parts of the peanut, for instance, that are common to other plants or other nuts or soy, it's almost like saying, eh, I kind of hate that whole category. And you're not going to be a just a specific hater, in which case it would be uh, a component that would just give you a little bit of blotchiness around the mouth. Versus, oh no, I hate that thing that says it's peanut about it, and that could spell disaster. And I put in muffin therapy because one of my fellows that was two years behind me uh, who went to Duke actually worked on desensitizing kids to milk by essentially cooking it at high heat into muffins and growing concentrations and giving it to the kid and having them induce tolerance. The same kind of stuff that we're doing on the peanut side and eventually egg and other uh, food components. Okay, atopic dermatitis. Funny enough, this one we used to think starts with a food allergy for a kid and then develops in this cracked, itchy, oozing skin condition called eczema, but allergic eczema not contact dermatitis, right? Contact dermatitis is like you got an earring with nickel in it, mm, a day or two later and a good amount of sweating and moisture, it starts flaring up just in that area, all right? Atopic dermatitis has a pattern. In the newborn period, usually it's the cheeks, 
As they get to be toddlers, I call it the Macarena. So it's all the flexor surfaces, right? Behind the knees, in the elbow creases, maybe around the neck, all the hot areas that are pressured. So now we believe that it's actually atopic dermatitis that starts and makes the kid susceptible to food allergies. Why? Part of it, just part of it is, and I always like to think, you know, allergy for dummies, because I have to understand it first. Food is supposed to go in through the mouth, get digested, processed, right, nutrients, all this stuff, and go down an intact alimentary tube. Thanks to all the shenanigans we're doing in life, and I'm not going to go and blame one particular industry, our food has changed, our air has changed, our water's changed, right? So now our skin's cracking. What you're seeing in that kid on the right is probably a picture of what his or her intestines look like too. But we don't see that. And the kid's not going to complain, oh, I've got itching in my esophagus or my intestine. There are no sensation, uh, there are no nerves there to, to report back itching. But on the skin there sure is. And part of it is the introduction of, just a little part, of food-based topical therapies. So at least my generation, we had a lot of peanut or soy-based uh, emollients, right? Topicals to smoothen out the skin and some kids will start reacting to that protein because it went in the wrong way. Analogy, think of a 90 year old man that was, in a, was on a walker going by your house every morning, okay? If he knocked on the door and you let him in, think of him as food, it'd be a process of come on in, sit down. If that guy suddenly jumped in through your side window into your bedroom, he's sitting there when you wake up, what are you going to do? You might even anaphylax to him, right? Like, it's, it's a violent reaction at that point. Like, what are you doing in here? You were not supposed to come in through skin or other means. All right, so to, to diagnose atopic dermatitis, you have to have itching. If it's not itchy, it's not atopic dermatitis, all right? So an 80-year-old that all of a sudden comes up with a patch like that, like a, the one you see on the face, maybe on their forearm, A, that's kind of suspicious for something else, like a cancer, and B, if it's not itching and if, and, and if they're telling you it really sears and burns and aches and whatever, it, you have to maybe do a biopsy and think of a, a different diagnosis. Therapy-wise, uh, the big advancement in... Uh, Really, these weren't available when I was actually studying allergy. Some of these NFAT modulators, so tacrolimus, pimecrolimus, and more recently, these topical biologics, crisoborol and dupilumab, who are uh, kind of in the last couple of years have developed, where we see great responses to spare the kid or the adult from applied topical corticosteroids. Because what happens with that? I have patients who have been on that generation, now they've got really parchment thin, uh, parchment paper like skin that breaks easily due to a lot, especially on the face, thin areas of steroid use through the years. But the main thing that you need to do, A, is avoid inflammation, so find the source. B, try to prevent infection, so staph, staph and strep can overcome the area. And I've had a kid who ended up in the burn unit twice from staph and strep infection. I mean, the skin was just burned at that point and he was bandaged and being treated like a burn victim. And to prevent all that, hydration. Hydration, hydration, hydration. So you get the child to dunk into the bathtub at least once a day in tepid water with some baking soda. All right? You don't see too many atopic dermatitis patients around the Mediterranean because their skin, they're dipping in there, they're getting a good amount of salt, water, hydration. Once the kid is out, dab dry, and then just put, in, put on what I call a stucco finish, which is Vaseline, essentially. And it has its own special powers that we've discovered recently, both antimicrobial and helping these phalagrins upregulate, the gene that actually helps that linking between two cells, so that you go from a white picket fence where things can go through or ooze out to a tight-knit skin. Next, who here has heard of asthma? Yeah, the big wheezer. 
This will present in the first few years of life. There's also an adult onset variant. In fact, we're getting so advanced that we're thinking endotypes at this point, not just the genetic background because, like I said, it's doubled in the last couple of decades. You can't explain that on genetic mutation where we, we're getting twice as many mutants uh, amongst us to, to scream out asthma. Uh, there, there are different ways of looking at it, but essentially if there's persistent asthma as a category where they're having two or more symptoms during the week, two or more symptoms at night during the month, or two or nights or more. Uh, they're in inhibited from doing their activities, so Tommy's no longer playing striker, he's playing goalie. Oh, he's a great scorer, but he's playing goalie. There's something wrong with that. Um, then it's time to think treatment, inhaled corticosteroids being the, the main uh, staple of that. And then we monitor it with pulmonary function, as well as a new, uh, relatively new measure, which is the nitric oxide coming out of the mouth. So I call that the smog test for asthma. And then there are a number of therapies and associations. One of them is we get into this pitfall of, oh, that last antibiotic took care of my cough, when in fact it was asthma. Well, macrolides, the mycins as a category, tend to have an anti-inflammatory effect on asthma. And so they're probably not killing anything that you're infected with in your lungs, but rather giving you this little boost of, whew, I feel a little better since taking that thing. And the tincture of time got you better. And then obesity by age three is a good predictor for airway uh, disease. But really obesity is a good predictor for a lot of other stuff. That means something's going wrong in that kid. And realize that a good three quarter of the asthmatics have an allergic component to them. And that's what's driving it. And we think of uh, no, no promotion of uh, airlines here, but a United Airway, where anything that's hitting your nose is affecting your lungs. And this was studied uh, about a decade and a half ago, where at least in animal models, they completely cut off the air circulation. So think I'm completely cut off. My nose is not even breathing for me, and I'm breathing through a chest tube and I put an allergen in my nose, so there's, there's no way the allergen can go down to my lungs. It's into my nose, and immediately my lungs behave the way my nose is behaving in an allergic way. And what do you get? In the nose, you, you're draining mucus, right? It might constrict, so it gets swollen, and it's itchy. The same thing's happening in your lungs. The cough, it's driven by neural reflexes, <laughs> the nerves and or the mucus overproduction, because your lungs going, let me wash this stuff out that you're throwing down my tube. And that's actually a protective factor to make mucus. Hey doc, I get congested in my lungs. Yeah, that's because you're normal. But what you're having is not normal, all right? And then uh, the hygiene hypothesis. So this is where, because of vaccination, which is a good thing, not picking up stuff off the ground, which may not be a good thing, right? You've heard of the Swedish moms study a couple of years ago where their kids had a lot less allergy. Basically, they pick up something off the ground that fell, put it in their mouth, and give it to the kid. What's that doing? Probiotics, sharing the germs, right? Because the kid came from you. You got the same germs, at least for the next few months. Um, and so by doing that, by creating a more sterile environment, Right Now we're not living on a farm, we're very sterile, we've got concrete buildings, no grass, no nothing around, and then these adjuvants, these smog and all the other stuff, we're shifting away from fighting parasites, or being born with worms coming out of our hiney, to those same cells are like, well, you took that job away from me, I'm unemployed, I'm going to create one for you. I'm going to be an allergen fighter. Make sense? So they've shifted to, I gotta do something. I'm good at allergies and parasites. Since there are no parasites, let me be a great allergy fighter for you, even though you don't need it. So that's the pro, uh, hy hygiene hypothesis. And then even adults who go to an urban environment, who grow up on a farm, at least for their first decade or so, have a protective effect from that farm life because they're inhaling cow manure particles, hanging out with the dog, right? All this stuff with, with a lot of it, not just a tiny amount like a cat in an apartment, but actually a, a flood of uh, uh, animals. 
And then when you look at these changes, what's disturbing is you start making some fixed changes. So your nose, your lungs actually start getting more, uh, less compliant. And some of the changes might be irreversible. So it's best to kind of prevention, as we always say. Now let's shift to otitis media. The one you'll hear in all the other sessions has to do with, uh-oh, immune deficiency. But the one I'm also going to point you to is one your neighbor might have, and you might say, well, make sure you don't have an immune deficiency. Check those pneumococcal titers, right? If everything's normal, don't give up, especially if it's a kid who's older than, say, six years old, because when you're born, your eustachian tube is, is pretty parallel to the ground. So guess what's going to happen? As you get inflammation and so on, well, it starts pooling back towards the ears, you get an infection. As you grow older, where I am now, it actually slants down. So you actually drain better into your mouth. So an ear infection, a middle, middle ear infection in, say, a 15-year-old is not normal. Okay? So they should be worked up for an immune deficiency. But an ear infection in a 1-year-old if it's not an immune deficiency, it could very likely be a, an allergy to food, for instance. And so when you take that food protein away, you get a lot of improvement. Now, an elephant in the room, and I'm not talking about the photographer who's trying to take pictures of me. I mean, <laughs> just look at him and go, ha, yeah. Um, Allergic bronchopulmonary mycoses. This was formerly known as, and I left it that way, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, because we thought it's only that strain that can actually give you this picture. This is where you've got an allergy to mold spores, all right? And it's increased as a risk if you're a patient with cystic fibrosis or atopy. Why? Because you're the one that probably got a lot of corticosteroids and that predisposes you to this. So there's a 20% lifetime risk in an asthmatic to have uh, an ABPM. And this is where you'll hear a patient say, oh, I'm coughing up and then brown mucus plugs are coming out, like little brown plug. Well, that's mold essentially, because you're allergic to it and you're actually uh, colonized most likely. And IgE testing for those patients will actually help us determine that that's what's going on. And anti fungals at that point with, believe it or not, some more steroids in bursts will help them uh, uh, succeed. Otherwise, it can lead also to permanent lung damage. Who here has heard of EOE or EE? You have. All right, cool. Eosinophilic, really gastro anything. So it starts with eosinophilic esophagitis. You're not supposed to have eosinophils there. Up to about 20 years ago, this was the batch of GERD, severe GERD patients who were not responding to high-dose uh, anti-reflux medication, all right? When they went back and looked at some of these slides of biopsies from the endoscopy, they realized, oh, wow, the ones that were not really getting better, we were not staining for eosinophils because we, we thought in the textbooks they're not supposed to be there, so why stain for them? And lo and behold, a big chunk of them had eosinophils in their gut. And so that new diagnosis came out of eosinophilic esophagitis. And now we know that there's duodenitis, gastroenteritis, colitis, and so on. Essentially, what is this? It's asthma of the alimentary tube. All right? So just like we have it in their airway, we have it in our food way. So uh, many of the patients, like I said, were unrecognized as having this and we're being diagnosed as severe GERD and not responsive to GERD therapy. The main complaint here, to make you guys kind of the sentinel surveillance people in the community, when you hear someone say, yeah, I eat chicken or beef or whatever and it just gets stuck in my throat and sometimes I got to go to the ER and get it pulled out and I think I'm allergic to chicken or beef. Hardly any of the time is that the culprit. It's probably something else that you're allergic to. And it's just the fibrous stuff, like a dry piece of bread or a dry fibrous uh, protein that when it goes down actually gets stuck. All right? And if you get rid of... So I had a gentleman who came in in his 70s and he said, yeah, the GI doctor wanted me to come see you. I'm like, okay, I'm happy to see you too. Um, <laughs> and he goes, I got food stuck and I know it's chicken. Uh, I said, 
why, because you saw that chicken came out, great. So I tested him for the foods and banana lit up like crazy on his back. And he goes, it's impossible, I eat bananas every day. I'm like, well, that's why it's possible. <laughs> you know, let's just get on with your GI friend so that I don't look like the jerk here, you know, banana. A banana? Okay, banana. No banana. <laughs> and magically he's better. So banana was triggering through either a food allergy per se or a food pollen associated allergy where banana is looking like kiwi or latex or something else for him that he might be allergic to. And it's just inflaming, kind of like asthma would, his alimentary tube. And once you take that culprit out, those dry fibrous things won't get stuck anymore. All right? Um, the, the sad part about this is for adults who are getting a lot of this impaction, kids usually will say just, it, it hurts when I'm eating or it, it, things get stuck or I, I, don't, I can't take pills anymore, I just, I'd rather have liquid. So for kids, it's about 25 to 50% uh, uh, of a prognostic good result to find the culprit and get them back to normal. For adults, it drops to about 10, maybe 20% in some studies. So it's a low chance of finding the culprit. And instead, they end up just having this kind of permanently till now. And there are a lot of studies right now in phase two and phase three looking at, again, some biologics and other products to see if we can reverse this in adults. Which brings us to food allergy. Uh, food allergy, as you know, this is, I don't know if some of you were in my uh, uh, complimentary and alternative medicine talk a little earlier, before noon. I, I like to look at things from a biopsychosocial aspect. So the biology is mostly the stuff that I'm presenting to you. The psychologic part is the burden it's having on you after the fact, before the fact, is like PTSD, pre-TSD. And the social part is affecting your family members, whether you admit it or not, or your coworkers and friends and neighbors. So food allergy is one of those animals where it's not gonna hit you every time. So you can have a peanut, real bad peanut allergy, and you're really good about, you know, I'm just gonna eat at home. Already the problem started right there. I'm just gonna eat at home. So you can't lead a normal life. Socialization, out. Family time outside, out. You see what I mean? Now, the parents, the siblings, the friends are going to look at you differently. Oh, that's our friend. We can only eat at her house. You see what I mean? So whether or not the, the, the insult's happening or not to you at that time. So we think 1 in 25, and it's actually just climbing like crazy. It's probably like 1 in uh, 18 by now, broadly, uh, children having food allergy. And uh, the cost is just astronomical. Why? You're carrying all kinds of rescue meds. You're, you're changing, you're diverting life basically to say, I'm not gonna go to camp. So now you put a toll on your parents and their time. Uh, I'm gonna do all kinds of things differently. And if you do end up in the hospital or the ER, the toll goes up because you might be ICU material and all that great stuff, paramedics coming through. And it's complicated because food allergy is not just simply an IgE mediated process. So you can see the spectrum going from left to right, going from IgE mediated, which is associated with anaphylaxis, all right, that we can test through skin testing. So with those, typically you'll get the hives, the swelling, um, you might get oral allergy syndrome. Who here knows what that is? Okay. For instance, I have it to oranges and eggplant, but good raw oranges and eggplants, right? If I go to a hole in the wall Italian restaurant that's reserving, not that any of the DC ones do, but you know, uh, reserving their eggplant parmesan two, three times, it's been known to happen, I'm not going to register it. But if it's a fresh cut eggplant, right, maybe partially dipped or whatever, or a dip with like a, a baba ganoush or something, it's going to tingle. But that's about all it's going to do. Maybe tingle from edge of the mouth to midway to the throat. Now we think there's about a single digit percent chance lifetime at best of carrying on deeper, but it's usually pretty self-limited. So that's in that IgE mediated part two. When you go to the way right, you're looking at non-IgE. So remember what I said about the, the food protein uh, induced enterocolitis with the milk in that two week old where they're just bleeding and having similar reactions to an allergic milk patient. 
Those are non -I So you could test them and see that, wow, they're not allergic to milk. Why is this happening? It's time to think, could this be food protein enterocolitis? Um, and then in between, you got a mixed bag. Eosinophilic esophagitis is in that bag, where it's got an element of immediate allergen and potentially delayed or toxic uh, reactions to foods. So is atopic dermatitis. So yes, we do skin test for an atopic dermatitis patient to see if there's an immediate allergen that we can take out. But just because we can't find one doesn't mean that there's not one that may react 10, 14 days later. Think poison oak, poison ivy, right? You scratch yourself, woohoo! Well, you wait for 10 days or 14 days later, you're gonna get a gnarly rash. The same concept with some foods or internally taken medications for some people where it's a delayed reaction. And all the antihistamines in the world won't help that. You know this from the woohoo party or woohoo, I'm hiking and getting scraped with poison oak or ivy. And so when you look at food allergy, eosinophilic esophagitis, uh, milk protein is the most common allergen for those patients. For atopic dermatitis, uh, about a third of kids will have moderate to severe atopic derm and have IgE-mediated food allergy, so it's a good idea to test them. For the food protein-induced enterocolitis, 50% of patients will react to both cow milk and soy milk. So that's when, that's a good thing to have in the back of your mind where little baby uh, Jonathan, we switched him from milk and he's still having soy issues. It must be his gut. Well, it could be he's, he or she's getting a lot of food protein related uh, toxic reactions like that. Which brings me to the elimination diet. Who's done an elimination diet here? Okay, have you tried eliminating the elimination diet? Good, because guess what happens? When you take out major nutrients, say milk, now you're missing out on your calcium, vitamin D, phosphorus, and all the other vitamins. You take out soy. Not that I'm a fan of soy per se, but it has its own uh, benefits as well. Eggs have some critical uh, vitamin B12, folate, selenium, and wheat with its thiamine, niacin, all right, iron, folic acid. So if you start doing these uh, blind, oh, let's just do a seven food elimination diet or a 12 food, the basic foods. Well, if it's basic, what's left to eat, right? <laughs> um, you got to be careful with that. And coming back to allergic rhinitis, now we're going to focus back on, I think, why you guys came here, the, the old allergic salute. When we look at this patient, so you could see him, right? You're all as, as capable as I am of detecting what's wrong with this guy. Blurt out a few things. I want three bad things. Nose crease. Swollen face. Eyes are blurry. And under the eyes? Exactly. Eczema. Okay. Did somebody say he's got a bad haircut? No, it's chopped off there. <laughs> don't, don't make fun of the guy. <laughs> he's volunteered his picture. So... But there's your physical exam, right? You start really profiling before he even opens his mouth up to think what could be wrong with this person that I can start already thinking in, in those terms. Someone's at my door. Um, then you do... <laughs> these guys are like, I can't believe this guy says stuff like that. Uh, then you do diagnostic testing. What does that entail? Anything from skin testing to blood work. Um, but continuing on with the exam, so on the left is a normal nasal passage, all right? You got opening, that's where the, the person's breathing through. On the right, first of all, the color's changed. Can you see that it's gotten a lot lighter? And if it's bad enough, it can actually turn purple-blue, almost like a Raynaud's phenomenon, right? When you're losing circulation, things turn blue rather than just a healthy lip-like pink. So on the right, you'll see an allergic nose with the turbinate completely swollen. And guess what? This guy's going to be a <gasps> mouth breather all day. All right, this guy or if it's, a, it's a, if it's a woman. And so A, you'll hear it from not just the spouse, but maybe the neighbors. Like I can hear this through, through the wall. Um, and B, it's not good for the heart to be breathing that way and putting that much pressure on through your mouth. 
Diagnostically, um, some centers will do nasal smears. We don't. Uh, a, it's kind of tedious, and second, we're not going to get super duper information that's specific. But allergy testing does help because you want to figure out is this a dust mite allergy, is it a, a tree pollen allergy, and so on. And that could be done through blood and or skin. Uh, the skin testing is helpful because it's measuring the IgE mediated, those initial reactions, those, those early reactions. Uh, you got to then be careful of cross reactions where, really, doc, I'm allergic to walnut, pecan, and Brazil nut when I told you all I react to is walnut? Well, maybe not. So pecan and walnut are pretty close. You might light up to both and be out okay eating one versus the other. So those are things you got to, you know, that's why we're not machines and we got to think. The patient has to be off antihistamines and some patients just cannot tolerate that. Um, word of warning on antihistamines, there's more and more data now that shows that there's a link with early onset dementia and cognitive changes with chronic antihistamine use. So that's not a good idea to use it for allergies, just, you know, per diem, or to help you sleep, all right? Because it's really drying out your brain, among other membranes. And then the other disadvantage of skin testing is you can't immediately test someone who got stung by a bee. You need to let a few weeks go by for that IgE to develop for them to stimulate and see a response that they just got violently. And obviously with eczema, if someone's got eczema on their skin, you might get more false positives. Really, I'm allergic to all those things? Probably not, but it would have been nice if your skin was clearer when we tested you. Uh, blood testing is good when you need to do this through the medication, so they're like, I can't get off the uh, whatever antihistamine of the, of the day is, so you can pick it up in the uh, blood. And it's the first step usually following anaphylaxis, because if someone says I anaphylax the penicillin, I'm not going to go right to skin testing first. I'm first going to check indirectly, do you have antibodies to penicillin? No. Then I might scratch you. Then I might do an intradermal. So stepwise and cautious. Um, and if someone's got a high IgE, which you know in the IDF world, hyper IgE syndrome, you've heard of that? They're going to have some IgEs just out to peanut, trees, and so on. So you got to take those with a grain of salt and think, this person has so many IgEs, they're going to have some false positive ones or clinically insignificant ones. How do you treat allergic rhinitis? This might look confusing, but just think you've got an allergen that comes in, and on the left you've got an early phase response. So histamines released. Hint, hint, treatment, antihistamines should work, and so will steroids, because steroids are kind of just a, let's nuke this thing. Way to the right, you'll see late phase responses, okay, with other mediators. Hint, hint, antihistamines will not work there. When is this significant? Think of the person that got a, a bee sting allergy, let's say you, the dad, um, just 10 minutes ago, and you had a reaction, your lips swelled, even though you got stung in the arm, okay? You're itchy. We give you a bunch of antihistamines and maybe even an epinephrine to open you up because your throat felt a little pressured, okay? Antihistamines should work immediately. Now, what do I worry about? Almost up to 18 hours later, you might have a biphasic response, a second response that comes in. Usually that one is not going to be treatable with antihistamines. And that's why the ER doc will give you a shot in the butt of a corticosteroid. Makes sense to, to, to really squash that secondary phase attack. And then you've got other symptoms that we talked about, pruritus, itching, and sneezing, and bottom right, congestion and rhinorrhea. So these are all happening at the blood vessel level, where your blood vessel is going, uh, I'm going to give up here. Right? Gauge opens up and now you're leaking out stuff. Well, the leaking out is kind of, it's almost like airbags. It's, it's a cautionary system uh, response that your body's having. And so for treatment, this is the next slide, you can see here where you can hit it with anything from antihistamines like we talked about early on to mast cell stabilizers at the top, leukotriene receptor antagonists, 
the corticosteroids, and then when you come back to the bottom, decongestants. Because decongestants are doing nothing to kind of uh, heal the immune system. They're actually just symptomatic relief, saying, let me really tighten up the blood vessels to drive mucus elsewhere. How am I doing on time, by the way? That means, shush. Oh. <laughs> no, I don't want to take questions. Let me, let me end with this. How about that? Last slide. <laughs> immunotherapy. So we've had over 100 years of allergen immunotherapy, which used to be homeopathy. We still have homeopathic docs, Eastern medicine. I'm a proponent of both, who will give you a little bit of what you're reacting to. Until we, find that we found that IgE molecule about 40, 50 years ago, and Western medicine said, aha, I understand this. I'm going to patent this. Now it's understandable. We can measure the toxicity levels and the lowest minimum doses and so on. And so immunotherapy has become a standard of Western allergy practice. Um, and I think that is it. And I will end with thank you. This is a special thank you because, and these are all with permission, on the left is uh, Michael and Wengar. Michael's the one that did the muffin therapy. He's holding a keyboard there. He's the shorter one. Um, the middle kid, you might have heard of partial ocular albinism. No? So this child's parents, and obviously he's ballooned up a little bit with all the prednisone here pre-transplant. Um, his parents are a bit darker, and their hair is a bit darker. And lo and behold, with recurrent infections, the pediatrician actually just did a simple blood smear in the office and goes, whoo, these neutrophils are ready to burst. Neutrophil disease? Normally you think either chronic granulomatous disease where you cannot make bleach. You have bleach bottles and you're like, they're empty. Versus shediakigashi, where you got the bleach bottles, the caps won't come off. That's your neutrophil. Just keeps increasing with bleach. And under the slide, you'll see like big granules of the bleach busters. And to the right, uh, dermatomyositis, juvenile. Looks like a peach, lung function, 40%. So I got a little foundation to give, give them music therapy in and out of the hospital. I will be quiet now and take questions. Thank you. You got it. A lot here. Yep. Um, we're gonna we're gonna call this the uh, Robo Round. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. So your thought on organic foods and impact on PI patients? Um, don't get me started on that, <laughs> because I always say, for patients who react to bread, for instance, I think I'm gluten celiac ish. Uh, I'm like, have you gone to France? Have you eaten? I do that when I go to France. I have some family there. I'll start my day with two croissants, have a baguette sandwich, something, and I'm not bloating. And here, I just, the minute I eat a, no offense to Panera bread, any kind of U.S. wheat, it, it, so there are genetic differences. And above and beyond that organic, heck yeah, but the problem is, if I'm growing organic, which I grow some of my uh, fruits and vegetables, but if my neighbor's spraying pesticides and so on, Right? And I have the organic license. I don't know. I don't know what's on my plant anymore. Okay? So it needs to be a very global approach to say enough of these bad things in the environment. Does that answer whoever asked that question? So, yes, the cleaner the food, the better. Uh, if you have allergies year round and it is not good to take antihistamines, what do you do? You had to go there, huh? Um, <laughs> First and foremost, nasal saline rinsing. Go back to, you're kicking me out too? Come on, man, there's like two minutes left. Uh, nasal saline, good for your mucous membranes and it's the same salinity as your mucous membranes. Guess what, I'm gonna defy that guy. I brought the presentation, I leave when I want to. Two more questions. Having a pet dog is a good thing? Very good question. What I meant was you need to be born in the barn or be get into the barn within two days. A lot of of the, of the animal manure and dander needs to hit you at the same time. Just having a small dog or a cat has been actually proven to be an allergen sensitizer. Lastly, if a child has a dress reaction to an antibiotic, is further testing needed? 
Uh, well, DRESS is uh, drug related, uh, drug rash, uh, eosinophilia with systemic syndrome, uh, symptoms. No, that's a completely different uh, reaction that almost is ICU material and can end up with SJS and toxic epidermal necrolysis. So that's different from allergy. It is in the allergy world and the allergist will come and consult for that. Cool? Am I in trouble? He's going to carry me out in cuffs now. Thank you guys. <laughs>